Hey, Bigger Pockets. I'm Paul Moore with Bigger Pockets and Wellings Capital, and I'm so happy to see you today. Welcome if you're on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, or if you are on uh, Bigger Pockets Live, I'd love to hear from you and let me know where you're from. Let me know if you can hear me. Um, I am so excited to be here today. It is past Halloween. It's almost Thanksgiving, and one thing real estate investors have to be thankful for is we have amazing tax benefits. And so we are looking to discuss the amazing tax saving opportunities of commercial and other investment real estate today. So I need to know if you can hear me. Thank you so much, John from Northern California. John, where are you from specifically? My daughter is in Redding, California. I'm not seeing very many people on the YouTube side. Hey, Mikhail Sokal from What Do You Do If You're Not Eligible for Bridging Alone? Okay, I'm going to try to answer that later. First, we're going to talk about tax saving strategies and think through exactly what you need to do from the UK. Okay, great to see you from the UK. Hey, my friend Nate Shields, Dude Real Estate. Folks, if you need some help on anything, any questions you have that I don't get to today, ask Dude Real Estate. That's Nate Shields, my friend from Madison, Wisconsin. Okay, so welcome. So glad you're here with me on a Friday afternoon. Um, and Dude Real Estate, if you can help McKeel, I would really appreciate it. Hey, Tico. Uh, hey, John. Uh, you're from Mendocino. Okay, awesome. Uh, is that close to Reading? I don't know where that is. Um, but anyway, we're so glad you're here. Hey, before we get into the many amazing tax benefits of commercial real estate. First, I want to ask you to give us a like or a share, a thumbs up. This will allow Facebook and YouTube's algorithms to like us and to promote what we're doing. It'll help all of us uh, know a little more, uh, uh, all of us get a little bit more promotion. It'll help more people join the Bigger Pockets community. So give us a thumbs up, a like, or a share. Before we get started, I know you thought this was a real estate show, Nate, but we're going to talk about 10 reasons not to invest in real estate. This is, comes from our friends at Good Egg Investments. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to go through 10 ways, 10 reasons not to invest in real estate. So hold on. Here we go. Number one reason not to invest in real estate. No one has ever become a millionaire investing in real estate, right? <laughs> Number two, wait, uh, actually 90% of the world's millionaires have become millionaires in part through real estate investing. So you'd rather be among the other 10%? I, I don't know, because you're a rare bird and you like to stay that way. Thank you very much. Number three reason not to invest in real estate. You have a brilliant idea for the next big thing. It's the Facebook meets Uber meets Twitter meets Salesforce of the bumper sticker world. Everyone's going to want one. You'd rather sink all your money into that. Good thinking. Number four reason not to invest in real estate. You prefer giving your money to panhandlers. They seem super nice, right? In Northern California, right, John? Um, number five reason not to invest in real estate. You want to work for your money. Why would you want your money to work for you? Number six, you don't want to invest in anything that could make you more than 10% in returns <laughs> because that's plain ridiculous, right? Number seven, you hate rainbows and, uni rainbows and unicorns and anything that's fun. Number eight, reason not to invest in real estate. Saving 3% or so of your earnings will be more than enough for retirement. No need to make any additional money. Number nine reason, no one ever taught you about real estate in school, so it must not be worthwhile. And number 10 reason not to invest in real estate. All the richest and most successful people in the world are investing in real estate. You certainly don't want to be associated with those scum. Okay. Hey, thanks again for putting up with my crazy uh, top 10s here. We're going to talk about not only 10, Nate, not only 10, Zach Gwynn, we're going to talk about a dozen ways to save money in real estate and uh, specifically through taxes. And so um, last week I told the story of a guy who had $2 million set aside to pay the IRS. 
at the end of 2018, he was talking to his CPA, who's a real smart guy named Tom Wheelwright. And he said, hey, why are you paying the IRS $2 million? Why don't you put that $2 million down on a large apartment building? And he, I don't know exactly how the conversation went, but I want to imagine that he said, well, I, I got to pay the IRS $2 million because I made a lot of money this year. He said, well, why don't you put it down on the apartment building and then do a cost segregation study on the apartment building and then depreciate, bonus depreciate, $2 million out of the $8 million on the apartment building. So he put $2 million down, borrowed $6 million, had an $8 million apartment building, depreciated approximately 30% of the building, not the land, the building value, which was about $6.8 million, I believe. 30% of that's about $2 million. He saved $2 million in taxes just because he bought an apartment building with that money rather than uh, buy the... Um, IRS's line that you need to pay them. So pretty cool, huh? Now, a friend of mine in California said, if the American people knew how little real estate investors pay in tax, we'd have another tax revolt on our hands. And tax revolt we will have if they find out. So shh, don't tell people, okay? We'll talk amongst ourselves. Okay, so anyway, this guy who was telling me about why we'd have a tax revolt said, um, that uh, he could show you a way to take $20 million, plow it into real estate, reinvest the proceeds for the first 10 years, and then after 10, near year 11 through 20, start paying distributions. The distributions would total $131 million over that second 10-year period, and the assets under management would be about $210 million at the end of 20 years, all from a $20 million investment. Sound crazy? I got something crazier. He said if handled perfectly throughout the process and every tax advantage was taken advantage of, then this guy would have potentially a zero, zero tax liability over the whole time. Is that crazy? Well, sounds too good to be true. Remember, we have an investor in chief in the Oval Office called the White House, and we have some of its friends in the Beltway that really helped us out in the last Tax Reform Act. So before I go on, I want to make a couple things crystal clear, crystal clear, that I am not a CPA. I'm not a tax strategist. I'm not a legal, um, I, I'm not a tax attorney, so I can't verify everything I'm saying is exactly accurate and bigger pockets can't take the liability. So if something goes wrong, it's on you, my friends. Okay, so what are these amazing tax benefits? Number one, I talked to a guy today who said, I'm thinking about investing in a REIT, real estate investment trust. Should I invest in a REIT or with you, someone like you, you know, who has a, a real estate investment fund? I said, well, you can invest in a REIT, but you know, they have the ups and downs of the stock market. They have the potential that there's going to be a, a, an errant tweet from the CEO that's going to drive their price down. There might be a war in the Middle East, or there could be some uh, oil price shakeup or just a bad mood on Wall Street and all that could affect your price. But that doesn't happen when you invest directly in real estate. Uh, when you invest directly through a fund that's investing directly in the real estate, not a re not only does that happen, you also get a K-1. So you can trace your return right to the operations and you get a K-1, which means you get all the depreciation, the bonus depreciation, the tax savings, all the other wonderful benefits of real estate investing. So invest directly in real estate, get a K-1. And number two way to save money in real estate, now this may not sound like a tax saving strategy, but let me tell you, I had a friend named Ed in California. Ed was paying about $120,000 a year in real estate taxes. And he uh, found a couple tax saving strategies that he didn't know about. So he went to his a uh, bookkeeper, accountant, CPA, and said, hey, what about this? What about this cost seg study? And what about this? And the guy goes, yeah, those are great ideas. You should do it. He said, well, would that save me a lot of money in taxes? And the CPA said, uh, yeah, that'd be great. And he goes, well, did you, you knew about this and you didn't tell me? And the CPA said, well, look, you pay me to do your tax returns, not be your tax strategist. Wow. I couldn't believe it. So Ed fired that guy, 
went out and got a tax strategist, which is the same guy that I work with now, and he actually uh, has paid about zero in taxes in the last decade since. Now, Ed is an ethical guy. He was just using the tax laws, and now the tax laws are even better than they were when I heard the story. And so pretty amazing that we can see tax benefits uh, like we see, and um, they're even getting better now. So hire a tax strategist. Third strategy to save money in real estate on taxes is return of capital. You know, you don't always have to have gains. You can return, uh, the operator can return capital to you. You can return capital yourself before paying gains. And therefore, there's no taxes on the return of capital. I mean, think about it. If you refinance your house, do you have to pay um, tax on that? Well, maybe in California, John. I don't know. But in general, you don't pay taxes when you uh, refinance your house. I was kidding about California. Um, my daughter lives there, and I just like to have fun with my friends out there. Um, do they have plastic straws yet? And are those fires all out yet? What's going on there? But anyway, seriously... Um, you can return capital, and by returning capital, you don't have to pay tax on that. It's just like refinancing your house. You can refinance an asset. Okay, number, where are we? Is that number three? I guess that's number three strategy. Number four strategy is accelerated depreciation through cost segregation. My friends, I could talk about this all day, but basically here's the deal. Think about a building. If you buy an apartment building, it's got permanent structures like walls, foundation, floors, things like that. But there's also some stuff that is not so permanent. So uh, uh, an apartment building can be depreciated over, I believe it's 27 and a half years. That means you take the sales price, let's say you pay 2.75 million for it, you divide that into 27 and a half, that happens to be 100,000 a year, and you can depreciate 100,000 a year equally over the 27 and a half years. And there you go. You can take 100000 off your tax return, in fact. But let's face it. Some of those items go bad in less than 27 and a half years. Let's take the roof. Let's take the carpet, the cabinets, the wiring, the lighting, the not all the wiring, but some of it could go, uh, the uh, light switches, all the lighting, the flooring, the, the appliances, um, software like you know security systems all that stuff can be written off much sooner because it's going to need to be replaced much sooner in many cases ceiling fans parking lot stripes shrubbery for you money python fans okay so a lot of that's going to be need to be replaced sooner and so what's going to happen um is that you can actually segregate those out from the main building. It's called segregating personal property from real property. And you can actually depreciate that much sooner. Now that's how my refurbished carpet. Great idea, Santi. So um, seriously, the, you can. Um, this is how you can actually dramatically accelerate your depreciation. And before we're done, if you can hang with me, folks, I'm gonna tell you a way to accelerate it more than ever before. I will tell you though, that's as a little hint, that's how our friend who bought the $8 million apartment building and put $2 million down on it, that's how he saved $2 million in taxes. So check it out. Cost segregation studies cost anywhere from $1,000 to about $12,000 for a typical asset. If you have a $200,000, $300,000 duplex or triplex, you know, you can um, set, you can do a cost seg study for probably about $1,000, $1,200 um, and save a ton on taxes. Now, number five way to save on taxes is correctly classify fully deductible repairs. Do you know sometimes an accountant or a bookkeeper will just assume that you should depreciate uh, a repair? Let's say there's a $1,000 roof repair. Well, that repair should be written off that year as a repair, not put out on a 27 and a half year schedule or even a 15 year schedule. OK, so correctly classify all your repairs and differentiate them from capital expenditures or CapEx. Number six tax saving strategy is kind of similar to returning principal. It's refinancing tax free. 
Now you can refinance. That means you can go like, okay, let me just use an example. So our fund um, invested in uh, uh, Beeville, Texas, 13, 000, town of 13,000, but it's got a great self-storage facility. It's the big game in town, 75,000 square feet. We purchased it for $2.4 million. The actually asking price was five and a half million, which was too high. But our, our operator, our joint operator with us, uh, purchased this for uh, $2.4 million. They went in and dramatically improved the property, got the value up in just seven months from like April to now, all the way up to $4.6 million, refinanced it for about 45% LTV. They refinanced $2 million. They took $2 million out of it and handed it back to investors. So now investors who put 2.4 million in got 2 million of it back. They can reinvest it anywhere we want, but there was no tax consequence. Pretty cool, huh? All right. And so now there's only $400,000 equity in that project. And it's already, um, the equity has already, what's 400,000? It's like already a 5X return in six months. 400% profit on paper, on paper in six months. Now it's not going to be an actual profit till it's sold. So of course we don't know uh, if it'll end up there. It might end up better or worse than that. I'm not advertising that. Uh, summary of tax breaks so far. So let's say you've invested with a reputable sponsor. You directly invested. So you're getting all the tax benefits. You've got your tax strategist on board who helped you with the opportunity. You made sure that you um, brought in a, you worked with a sponsor who's gonna do a cost segregation study and you're gonna get this massive loss on your return. We're gonna talk more about that later. And you've now just refinanced early and got 50 to 80% of your money back. How much you paid in taxes so far? Zero, as far as I know. I can't guarantee that, like I said earlier, but that's what we would expect. Number seven way to save on taxes for real estate investors is defer sales taxes at the sale through a 1031 exchange. Most of you know what a 1031 exchange is. It's a like kind exchange. Did you know that the 1031 exchange was threatened in this tax reform bill that was being debated exactly two years ago today? And the 1031 exchange was taken away, but not for us, for art, collectibles, planes, trains, automobiles, all kinds of things, but not real estate. As God intended, it's still in place. That was a little joke. Okay, so 1031 exchange is still in place. That means if you exchange a mobile home park in Cleveland for one in Cincinnati, you don't have to pay taxes on the gain from the one you exchanged out of in Cleveland. Okay, now do you have to go that specific? No, of course not. Real estate into real estate works in general, okay? So when I said cash out equity, I mean you basically hand back the cash that you had invested in it. You cash it out through a refinance and hand it back to the investors. So I just happen to see that question pop up above my head here, but I can't get to other questions right now. Dude Real Estate, Nate Shields, is trying to answer questions while I'm doing my little fun talk on tax savings here. This is one of my favorite subjects, by the way, and if you're a real estate investor for very long, it will be one of yours as well. 1031 Exchange is a great vehicle to save on taxes. Another one, however, is dying. What? Paul, did you say that? Yeah, I did. Is it possible to avoid death and taxes? Well, probably not death, but it is possible to avoid uh, taxes when you die. Here's why. I know of some people who wanted to hurry up right before they died and sell all their assets and make sure that they paid all their gains and they could give cash to their kids. I know a guy right now who just did that. Uh, he's 95 years old. But guess what? If you hold on to that asset and you pass that asset or those assets along to your heirs, guess what? There's a reset basis. A potential step up in basis means that if you bought a mobile home park, let's say for a million dollars when you were 80 years old, 
and sold it for, say, $4 million when you were 99 years old, that's possible, right? That four million, what I say, $3 million gain would be taxed if you sell it. But if you don't sell it, there'd be a step up in basis and your heirs could argue that it's worth $4 million when they got it. Therefore, there's no capital gains. It's a beautiful thing. And that is a very real possibility for real estate investors. I love real estate investing. All right. So you don't necessarily have to both die and pay taxes. You have to do one or the other. Ha ha. So another option for tax savings is self-directed retirement funds. My friends, if you've got a 401k at your job, you probably cannot invest in real estate with it. If you've got a an IRA through your corporation, you probably can't invest with in real estate. You're probably investing in stocks, bonds, mutual funds. Boo. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I think we should diversify, of course. But did you know you can roll that over in almost every case um, to a self-directed IRA or a self-directed Roth IRA or a self-directed um, 401k, solo 401k? which is also called an EQRP, um, you can roll these over and you can save on taxes. You can invest in what you want to invest in. Okay? Pretty cool, huh? I would highly recommend that you consider uh, investing through a self-directed IRA. I've been doing it for over, I think, 15, 16 years now. I have a great story about how I made $100,000 on a deal but because I bought it through my IRA, I didn't pay taxes on it. I just plowed the profits into the IRA. Fun. Okay, number 10 of 12 ways to avoid taxes in real estate investing is avoid passive loss limitations. You say, Paul, how can I avoid passive loss limitations? Well, become a qualified real estate professional or have your spouse become a QREP. Now, what I mean by that is this. If you work 750 hours a year or more in real estate and the majority of your income or it's your efforts and your income, I think, come from real estate. So in other words, if you work, let's say, 2,000 hours a year and over 1,000 of that's from real estate in real estate, you can possibly qualify to be a qualified real estate professional, which means your passive loss limitations are not limited just against your capital gains and your passive gains, but also it can be put against, those losses can be taken against ordinary income. Did I hear anybody shout for joy? Yes, I did, I think. So anyway, it's an awesome thing to do. And if you're on bigger pockets, chances are you're pretty passionate about real estate. Now I talked to an orthodontist recently who said, well, I can't do that. I, obviously most of my time and income is spent as an orthodontist. I said, well, um, what about your wife? Is she involved in the orthodontics practice? Well, no. Well, what if she went out and spent 750 hours a year or more in real estate and had that as her main source of income? Light bulb. Okay, so there's lots of ways to do this. Being a qualified real estate professional just puts icing on the cake. Okay, you might want to know what number 11 and 12 are, and I'm going to tell you one other provision of the new tax law was bonus depreciation. Now, there's section 179 depreciation, but bonus depreciation is to is the opportunity to actually take anything in a cost segregation study. It was put in a three, five, seven, 10, 15 year bucket, meaning 15 years or less, and you can actually write it all off in the first year. Okay, now of course there's limitations to this and there's, you know, there's things that, you know, that this doesn't cover. But I mean, let's say you had um, a 300 unit apartment complex with a lot of roofs and all the roofs needed replaced. What if you spent half a million dollars in roofs? Could you take that off in one year? Well, no, you'd have to, you'd have to put it out over 15 years because it's a capital expense. Wrong, Paul. You can actually do it in one year now because of bonus depreciation. Who thinks that's a good idea? Who thinks that's amazing? And that's how our friend, please give us a thumbs up, a like, a share, a smile, all that stuff if you do, because I want to make sure Bigger Pockets doesn't fire me. Okay, 
So anyway, um, Zach Gwynn, did you hear that? So anyway, uh, seriously, um, I highly recommend that you use bonus depreciation. Another way to uh, avoid taxes is through Section 179. I already touched on this earlier, so I'm not going to count that as one of the 12. That's basically taking repairs and making them different from capital expenses. Thank you so much for the hearts and likes and all that good fun stuff. Now, one more way to save on taxes as a qualified real excuse me as a real estate investor is to use a deferred sales trust. I've never talked about that on this show before. But if you want to learn more about a deferred sales trust, if you have at least half a million dollars in um, sales from almost any kind of asset, real estate or something else, you can often plow that into a deferred sales trust and you can draw, drag that sale out over like 15, 20, 30 years and you do not have to pay um, you do not have to pay capital gains on that, at least at that time. And so there are about 12 ways to save money in real estate investing. One other one, I'll give you a 13 for a bonus before we get into Q&A here, is I would recommend that you check out the new tax law because it allows you to take an additional 20% uh, I believe it's 2.5% of the sale price or 20% deduction for any pass-through income. I do believe you have to be actively involved in real estate to take that. Okay, I'm going to get into Q&A, which means you're going to see this big, bright, shiny reflection on my glasses. And I'm sorry for that. But anyway, so let's get into Q&A. So if you put in a question in Facebook Chances are I'm not going to get to it um, unless you copy and paste it back in. So, Kata Walters, thank you so much. That's very kind of you. Tell Bigger Pockets. Um, Ethan Atkinson says, Cost seg, yes. Are there any reasons not to do it? Ethan, I have heard that there, like, if you're selling really quickly, it might not be that big of a benefit to do a cost seg study. <clears throat> Daniel says, what do you think's about? Hey, Daniel Rivendenera. I just wanted to say that. What do you think's a better investment, a duplex or single family? I would go with the bigger, the better. So duplex. Jackie, hello again from Fort Worth. Hey, Nathaniel Troop. I am looking for owner finance deals for small multifamily properties in Oakland, California. How would you go about attracting sellers to this kind of deal? You guys might not like my answer, but I really truly believe what I'm going to say, especially in California, Nathaniel wait for the downturn wait for the downturn when people are scrambling check out howard mark's book uh mastering the market cycle getting the odds on your side and it's going to teach you to catch a falling knife warren buffett and howard marks did a great job of this in the last recession and i'd highly recommend you do that hey candace v I just bought a home in september but i see an awesome opportunity to buy a great real estate deal i just want some direction in the house is now on the market. Good. 59,000, three bedroom, one and a half bath, perfect location next to airport. Hey, Candace, don't tell us what airport because we don't want anybody to swoop in on it. <laughs> but what's the rental possibility on that? I think you should run that through Dude Real Estate and let him do some quick math because I can't do math except in my head real quick while I'm driving. What? Anyway, you get the idea. Flex Media, guys, check out XRP Ripple. The company's making big move money, Graham is going to make an XRP skyrocket. Okay. Sky PA says, can I ask you something? Uh-oh, I'm scared. Do you have tax benefits when you buy an old house, say 30 years old and how? Yeah, they're all the same. Sky PA, it's the same. You can still depreciate an old house. You can depreciate a 100-year-old house. The question is, when was it acquired? Not when it was built. Um, any tax people on here want to refute me? Maybe you can, but I'm Sure, because I, I have a 1962 uh, multifamily that we're depreciating. T. Bellamy, Bellamy, thank you for all your comments on here. Do you think buying acres and building storage units on it? Okay, so I have a special report on when uh, on self-storage investing, and I'm a huge, huge fan of self-storage. I've just written a book. Bigger Pockets Publishing is publishing that book. Is that right, Katie? Um called the book on self-storage. The problem is it won't be out till middle or late 2020. 
And so uh, I've got a special report you can read in the meantime. If you want my free special report on how, when, where, how, whatever, to build a self-storage facility, check out uh, my profile at uh, on Bigger Pockets and ask for the free special report on self-storage investing. You can also go to my website, Wellings, W-E-L-L-I-N-G-S, wellingscapital.com forward slash resources. What I want to be says, that's your name? Cool. Hello, sir. I'm a big, huge fan of you. How nice of you. Oh, I was wondering if I could interview you on the subject of real estate. I'm 14 and I would like some tips for my future. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Hey, look, you're going to get a free book. I'm going to mail you a free copy of my book, The Perfect Investment, or I can just send you a PDF copy if you like reading that way. And I'm going to give you a free special report on self-storage and mobile home parks. And we'll do a phone call. I love having a 14-year-old. I'm going to be doing a call next Wednesday at noon. I want to make sure you're on it. Just contact me through my Bigger Pockets profile. I'll have a few other people on there. But it'd be great to meet you. I don't know your name, but can't wait to uh, chat with you. Make sure you tell me who you are when we talk. Saul Martinez, hello, says, I guess I just worry because I don't, have work history for nearly six years. I'm getting a job soon though. And to take this to the next level and finally be clear to work. Okay, great. Man, I hope and pray that that works out for you, Saul. Odingo says, what is all this info applied? Would all this apply to the UK also? I think some of this could, but I'm not a tax expert. I've never worked in the UK, so I don't know. Does anybody else on the UK know if this applies to them? So Ethan Atkinson says, what do you think of multi-type properties like storage with old mobile homes out back with a nice home on the own, home the owner built for themselves and has room to put, put more of either? Okay, so Ethan, here's what I think. I think you should probably try to turn that into a mobile home park only or a self-storage facility only and leave the rest where it is. But I would really focus on marketing as one or the other. Consider splitting the home off or consider renting the home to somebody who could be the manager of the whole thing if it's not going to be you. Uh, but otherwise, maybe consider splitting the home off. I hope that helps, Ethan. Uh, thanks for your questions. Appreciate you. Um, okay, Eduardo Armenta says, I have poss five possible... 10 GS. I have five possible $10,000. If I can sell my bike, how can I get started? Uh, Eduardo, I highly recommend you consider partnering with somebody unless you have a tremendous amount of knowledge on this. And um, uh, I would highly recommend that you consider crowdfunding if you don't want to partner with somebody. And crowdfunding is a passive investment, but I think you'll like that. Mario Martinez. Hello, Mario says, can I do bonus depreciation on a property I just purchased in August? You bet you can. Absolutely. Now, you can't do a 1031 exchange after the fact, but you can do bonus depreciation. Go find a good cost segregation study. By the way, quick hint, I would not do an engineering cost segregation study. I would do a regular one unless you have a very expensive property. Kirk Daniels. Hello, Kirk said, uh, is it unreasonable to do a BRRR or a flip while having a 40 hour a week job? It's tough, Kirk. It's tough, but it's possible. Uh, a lot of people have done it. Lots and lots. I mean, thousands of people have done it. I just think that it's hard to live that way on an ongoing basis. It's possible to do it a few times. Dezillis, hey, Dezillis says, hi, Paul, what would be a good deferred tax strategy when buying a multi-million dollar property in a trust? Dezillis, can you tell me more about what you're asking? I, I don't know what type of trust, what type of property. Are you going to actively manage it or passively? Someone says, EL, hello, EL, is it better to invest in land for a mobile home park or self-storage? Hands down, hands down, self-storage. They're hardly building any more mobile home parks. Now, oops, sorry, my caveat is if it's, too, if there's too much self-storage in the area. If you want to know if there's too much self-storage in your area, go to a website called Radius Plus, pay the fee to get that, or you can get my uh, self-storage special report, which will teach you how to do that. It's very, very unlikely you're going to have a successful ground-up mobile home park these days. It's extremely. Now, Elvis did it in Memphis 
but that was in the 50s, my friends, or maybe the 60s. Phil Fagan. Hey, Phil, I live in Denver. I love Denver. I used to live there. And adhering to the 1% rules seems very difficult these days, right? Do I wait for the market to change or do I bend the rules? Yeah, you bend the rules and you also bend your return, Phil. I wouldn't bend the rules. You might want to consider going to a place like Memphis or Indianapolis where you can still get a 2% rule. Or you might want to consider passively investing in a deal that has much, much, much higher than 1% or 2%. And there are experts out there and uh, who, and, and we invest with some of these experts who get a much, 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 much higher return than that. And that's what I would do. Uh, Muthiah says, can we get a transcript or listen to this again to get all 13 tax deductions? Yes, Muthiah. There's actually a way through YouTube to get a transcript. Can you believe that? You, you just have to Google it. Uh, my friend showed it to me. But yes, this will be replayed soon. Like as in an hour from now, it'll be available on YouTube and Facebook. Muthaya says, can we get a train? Oh, I just said that. What? Sandra Clements. Hello, Paul. Help my credit stinks in the 500s, but I have an asset I own, no mortgage and rent. How can I get more real estate? You know, you could potentially, uh, you know, get your credit score up as soon as you can and get a refi on that property. That's what I would do. Sandra, if you want more advice, ask and you shall receive either from Nate or I. Nate is dude real estate. He's answering a lot of these questions. You guys are so amazing. I can't believe I get to do this. Seriously, I can't think of anything else I'd rather be doing on a Friday at 4.30 than talking to you guys. Thank you so much for joining. I can't believe you're listening. I'm really grateful that for all of you. I'm really serious. Um, Arturo, yes, you can get the list by listening to this again on YouTube or Facebook Live. Uh, Sravanthi Kaza says, would you keep or sell a house that will be ours in 13 years if we are potentially paying 250 a month if renting as the taxes in Ann Arbor are high for non-homestead? Okay, I understand the question. Would you keep or sell the house? Um... So you're paying 250 a month and that's just taxes and you're renting the house out to somebody and it'll be paid off in 13 years. Sir Ranthi, could you possibly tell me a little more about your situation? Just give me a little more detail and I'll try to answer. Luke says, what's Luke Phelps? Hey, how are you? What's the benefit of bonus depreciation over traditional? You can dramatically accelerate your appreciation. Your what? Your depreciation. And now, you guys, have you heard the thing about if you take a penny and double it every day for 30 days, you'll have one point, a little over $1 million. But if you take a penny and double it every day for 30 days, but you tax it along the way, then you will have not a million dollars, but like 60000 It's huge difference. If you can kick the can down the road on taxes, you will be very, very, very happy in the end. Right, Nate? All right, Stephen Dittrich says, I'm an all-cash investor, but can't even find a deal that meets the 1% rule, let alone 2%. Lake Tahoe, Reno. You will. Just wait a while. Well, where do I find places to invest or funds to join in on? Stephen, how much do you want to invest? Because if it's, you know, under 50000 or so, you can go to a crowdfunding site if it's over 50000 especially if you're a credit, an accredited investor, there's all kinds of great syndicators, options, funds you can use. That's the world that I live in. Um, Luke Phelps says, can assets that we've purchased in the past be converted to bonus depreciation only new assets? If you purchased the, the asset or went under contract to purchase the asset after September 29th, 2017, then you can use the new bonus depreciation. If you went under contract or purchased it before September 29th, or maybe it's 28th, 2017, then you cannot use the new bonus depreciation. But I still highly recommend a cost segregation study and investing um, in getting the depreciation you can that way. Jackie says, how, hey, Jackie Nigan again, how are property taxes affected if Texas becomes a state income tax state? 
Well, your property taxes should go down, Jackie, but you know, governments don't like to reduce taxes. I don't know if anyone's ever noticed that. That was a little drum hit. So um, I doubt if it'll go down, but it should. Jonathan Rhodes says, um, I'm a new investor. I live in the Midwest having funds to spend. I'm nervous to buy in off season as I'm looking at single family homes. From what I understand, most people like to move in the summer. When kids are out of school, most people I would imagine I would rent to would be families as I'm looking at a three bedroom, one or two bath house. Mm -hmm. Any advice to a nervous investor who's waiting for the perfect time to buy? Jonathan, I'm going to shoot in the dark here. And Nate, I hope you can weigh in on that, even though it's on the Facebook side. If you can save enough by buying in the dead of winter, like if you can save two, three, four, five thousand dollars, you'll also have a few months to close, which means maybe you'll be able to put it under contract in January, close in March. And then you'll have March and April to clean it up, fix it up, paint it up, photo it up. And you'll have it on the market hopefully May 1st. Um, that's perfect timing to me. So, Jonathan, I think if you can, yeah, again, buy in the den of winter, you can possibly save enough money to make it worth it. I mean, if you can save 3000 on the purchase price, that's, you know, how much, what's that, six months of rent? I think it's worth it. Maybe you see it different, and maybe I'm wrong. Uh, Sam Silva. The Sam Sil Value Binder. Thank you. That's a nice thing to say. Ben Martinez. I just bought a house for seventeen thousand. Wow. They need some repairs. How much should I ask for rent? The houses are located in a thirty to fifty thousand dollar area. So you're going to be in a C class area. Guessing that you just need to check the other rents in that area, Ben. Of course, I'm going to guess that your rent's going to be about five hundred a month, more or less. But that's just a guess. Please. Don't take that and run with it. Talk to some realtors, go on Craigslist, do some research, ask the neighbors. Uh, you got to get you know in line with what the neighbors are charging. Nicole, Noel, hello. How do you take the money off of my business credit cards to buy property without doing expensive cash advance? Hmm. Well, probably get one of those credit cards where they give you a free cash advance, number one. Number two, Call the credit card company and try to negotiate with them. They occasionally will let you do that. And uh, Or three, get a new credit card that has a free cash transfer, uh, balance transfer. Andrew Farias says, what are your thoughts on lease options? Man, I got so many thoughts on lease options, Andrew. I'm so glad you asked, but I don't have time to go into them all. If you want to join my call next Wednesday, we can chat about that. I really believe in lease options, rent to own, lease option sandwiches, uh, lease options themselves. I said that twice. Um, highly recommend it. And um, I think that that would be something that you should really uh, check out. It's one of my favorite two ways of getting into real estate if you're brand new. And that's doing rent to own sandwiches, lease option sandwiches, and also the Airbnb uh, model, which is Airbnb arbitrage, where people can make over $10,000 a month in their spare time. You say, Paul, how can I make over $10,000 a month in my spare time? If somebody, if a few of you ask me, I will tell you. Eduardo Armenta, hello. What's a great crowdfunding website? Check out my friend Ian Ippoloto's site. It's called the Real Estate Crowdfunding Review, and it'll tell you the best crowdfunding sites. Dude Real Estate says, Michael, it probably depends. Okay, Sykes Channel, I'm a single mom. Awesome, Sykes Channel, thanks for joining us. It would like to start investing in real estate. Can I start by buying tax liens? Is that a good idea? Yeah, but you can get eaten alive if you don't know what you're doing. You have to ask yourself, why has someone else not bought this tax lien? So be really careful. And you know maybe consider partnering with somebody else who throws money in the game as well and do it together till you really learn what you're doing. I think it's a good idea though. There's not a lot of tax advantages to that though. Art T says, I'm about to own my first home. Will be a rental within a year. What's the first or most important thing with regard to tax savings I should do? Cost segregation study for sure, Art T, assuming it's over a dollars $150,000 home. Michael says, okay, dude says, Steve says, hey, Steve Mansfield, is a 1.5% still a good deal? It's been hard to find 2%. Steve, it depends. If you're in Arizona, Nevada, California, or Florida, I would be careful. 
uh, because they have big ups and downs in value and you can get burned if you don't be careful. Thoughts on Section 8 rentals? Hey, did you guys know that mobile home parks, you can actually acquire a mobile home through Section 8 vouchers now? Just heard that. Sonny says thoughts. Um, yeah, you know, I don't like really renting to Class C tenants and government-backed tenants. It's, it's just a risky business. They often trash the place and they don't even pay their little part. Angel says, where am I able to get the contracts to wholesale? Are you guys all Bigger Pockets Pro members? Because if you're not, you should really consider joining Bigger Pockets Pro. The Pro membership is the best decision I think I've ever made in my 27 or whatever years of business. And I'd highly recommend you join Bigger Pockets Pro. You can get all kinds of contracts in all kinds of states, and you can get a discount if you know where to get it. Google that. Um, because I just forgot where to get the discount. Hey, Parker Fleming. Hey, Zach Gwynn or anybody from Bigger Pockets, if you're on here, tell me the discount code, please. And I'll tell it to everybody. Parker Fleming says, I'll take the bait. How do we make $10,000 a month with Airbnb? John Hamilton says, where have you had the best luck in finding accredited and non-accredited investors? Oh, John, I could talk to you about that all day, my friend. Uh, I'll tell you the one thing to do for sure is create a ton of good content. Be a blogger on Bigger Pockets, start a podcast, be a guest on podcasts, and write books. Those are the four things I'd recommend. And LaRonda Turner says, what incentives do you give people who crowdfund a deal? Can you repeat that, LaRonda? I'm not sure I understand the question. Michael says, build or buy a duplex. If you can build one for less expensive than buying one, I would do it. Uh, okay, so I've had a few people ask me about how to make $10,000 a month. I'm going to give you the very, very simple version. And if you have I ever invested in mobile homes, Freddie Sapp, I love mobile home parks. I hate investing in mobile homes. Such a difference. What was I talking about? Yes. Okay, I'm talking to myself now. Bigger pockets. Where's that, where's that discount code? Anyway, um, I'm having fun here. I'm a little slap happy on a Friday. I need some coffee. Nate, help. Okay, so um, here's the very simple version. If you want the full version, contact me at my Bigger Pockets uh, Pro, excuse me, my Bigger Pockets profile, and I'll give you the full, I'll give you access to the full version. It's just a friend of mine. I don't have his code now, his website. All right, so here's what you do you go work out favorable turns to lease a house or an apartment, number one. Number two, you uh, plan to furnish that apartment fully, really nicely furnish it and get photos. Number three, go out and advertise on Craigslist and everywhere else you can, corporate short-term housing. Number four, there's 17 other ways my friend Al will teach you um, to do this. I just saw Al at the Mid-Atlantic Summit at, for Bigger Pockets, and he has all these 17 different ways to market these corporate housing opportunities, including um, including going to the local hotels, the long-term stay hotels, and hanging around the lobby, drinking a beer with them, having a cookie, eating macaroni and cheese, and um, asking them uh, where they stay, where they work, and then following the trail back to the corporate office. Oh, I just noticed, hey, there's 50 nurses staying at the Homewood Suites, and you go to that hospital HR department and say, how would some of them like, um, how would some of them like to stay at a nicer furnished apartment instead for less money? So what you do is, as soon as you get a tenant, like a, say a six month tenant, you quickly furnish the apartment. You can furnish it first, of course, and take photos. That's a little better actually. And then you get the tenant in and you rent the apartment for, let's say, $8.25 a month. That's a, a typical number in my apartments. And then you furnish it fully and then you re-rent. Of course, you have to do the electric, the, the water, sewer, cable, internet. And that's getting pretty cheap these days. And then you can uh, re-rent it out for maybe $1,500 to $2,000 a month. So if you got $800 in it, plus you got furnishings, plus you got utilities. Let's say you have 1200 a month in it. If you can rent it out for 2000 a month, you can kill it. Now, my friends, 
about a year and four five months ago on this show, I told the story about how you can make $10,000 a month doing this. I got a call from two guys, maybe they're on here today, who told me, I took your advice, I did your strategy, and I'm not making $10,000 a month. I said, oh, what are you, what's going on? They said, we're making $75,000 a month. I said, wait a minute, what? They said, yeah, we're using the corporate arbitrage strategy for corporate long-term tenants. And by the way, you plug Airbnb tenants in the gaps, like when you have gaps in the schedule. So you can make more money for a lot more effort plugging Airbnb in the gaps. So you can have Airbnb and corporate rentals, but you don't have to own the unit to do this. That's the mind-blowing part, my friends. You just have to have the furnishings and you can rent the furnishings. Get a month-to-month -month lease on the apartment if you can. Go to a brand new apartment building that's just uh, opening up and let's say they have 300 units and only 100 are occupied. It's going to take them two more years to lease up. Well, what if they give you a month-to-month -month lease over in a corner unit and you can, you know, I mean, maybe pay them an extra $100 a month for a beautiful new apartment fully furnished by you? It's amazing. And Dude Real Estate has a video now on Airbnb arbitrage. Check out Dude Real Estate on Facebook and his YouTube channel. LaRonda Turner says, what I mean is this. If I go on crowdfunding, if I go on GoFundMe to finance a deal, oh, if you're, okay. Should I be offering people some return on the money they sent me? Is that customary for real estate crowdfunding? You know, uh, the Jobs Act of 2012 allows you to do that, LaRonda, but you have to follow the rules. Yeah, you should be giving a return. Maybe, uh, for example, a 10% preferred hurdle rate, and then maybe a 70, 60, 40 split after the 10% hurdle. So in other words, you give them the first 10%, and then you, get, you give them 60% above that, you get 40%. That's just an example, LaRonda. Thanks for clarifying the question. Parker Fleming is here, and he says, I live in Denver. We are only allowed to do short-term rentals in your primary residence. Are you aware of any tax tactics to get around that, local restrictions like that? I'm not. Uh, is anybody else able to get around that rule? It's, you know, Bigger Pockets obviously is based in Denver, so maybe some of you all know. I don't know, but I'd love to hear if you do. It sounds like you're pretty stuck. Um Edward Carroll says, best way to get loans from the bank. Go develop a relationship with a local lender, a credit union, or a regional bank, I would say, Edward. Michael says, okay, Michael Perez says, a house is being remodeled. How do I put it under contract? Are you buying or selling it? I'm not clear on that, Michael. Josh Cab says, I bought my first home. Two family primary residents. I have the rent covering the mortgage, thirty-six thousand a year. What should I be most concerned about with taxes? Josh, could you clarify the question? I mean, I think you should be concerned that the taxes will go up, and you might want to be prepared to fight that. It's really easy to fight these things in Texas, but not on most other places. But you can. Michael says best way to negotiate with banks on bank-owned property. Oh. Well, um, on bank-owned property, again, just get to know the banker and try to make a low offer and be ready to walk away. Use the strategies from Pitch Anything and Start With No. Those are two books I highly recommend. Start With No and Pitch Anything by our friend Oren Claff. Um, EL says, I felt better about paying contractors after they finished the job. How do you tell them without insulting them? Just tell them, well, see, it's a contractor's market right now. They can set terms. Just tell them, you know, that's how you do it. You're going to pay fair. You're going to pay the same hour they're done. But um, tell them that's how you, you want to do it. I don't know if that'll work in your market. It's terrible to pay them in advance unless they have a great track record and reputation. LaRonda Turner again says, thank you for answering Love Your Lives. Thank you so much. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're in the five-minute fire round. <laughs> fire round. Okay, I'm insane today, aren't I? Okay, so if you haven't got your question answered, what I need you to do is 
copy and paste your question back in the box and I'll do my very, very best to answer it. And then Dude Real Estate's gonna hang on here. Hey, if you haven't met Nate Shields, you ought to. He can really help you with a lot of your real estate questions on and offline. So here we go. Cryptic says investing 40,000 in a $1 million multi-unit and maybe get a thousand a month with the assumption it'll be worth more than 1 million when it's paid off versus using that 40,000 to be our, our multiple units over time. I would definitely go with the latter cryptic. I would go, I would never count on appreciation to be sure you're gonna make your returns. Adam Janko says, is the leasing model you're considering buying some units as well on the way? Yes, you can buy the units as well. <clears throat> Higher risk, lower return, I think. Sykes Channel says, thank you for the great information. Thank you. Woody Ah says, never pay a contractor in advance. Start with 10%. Totally agree. Sam's Silva Value Binder. <laughs> Planning to buy my first property in a cheaper area a few hours away near a major university using an FHA loan and renting out to students by the room. Any tips from me? Can you use an FHA loan without living in the property? I'm not sure, Nate. Um, I would say that you might want to check that out, but I'd highly recommend you consider trying to do that. Markins El says, I never want to miss live block bigger pockets again thanks that's everyone that's helping thank you markin says me and my partner make 110,000 combined what's the best way to invest to retire within 10 years markins i would check uh you know like real estate crowdfunding review and look for some non-accredited opportunities unless you're accredited which means you have a million or more in assets, not including your home, and then look for some opportunities with fund and syndications. Okay, Dezilla says the multi-million dollar property is in a living trust. I'm trying to help the seller with his capital gains. Dezilla, contact me offline and we'll get together on that. I might have some ideas. I, I don't have anything coming to mind, to be honest. Drayton says advice for a 17-year-old, awesome, who wants to become an agent and go into investing at some point. Yeah, jump on my call next Wednesday. I can give you information if you contact me at my profile. Uh, somebody says, can you get me an interview with Brandon Turner? I can't. I've never met Brandon in person, even though he and I have done a podcast together. Um, I don't have a BP discount code, though somebody else said it was 1234. I remember when it was BP1234 with a capital B and capital B, P. Donald B says, what's the best method of crowdfund down payment interested in quadplex and possibly looking for an investor? I don't know. Gosh, I'm sorry. I would go out and get friends and family if you can instead of crowdfunding. But I might be wrong on that. Pierre Ede. Hey, Pierre says, I purchased three properties using HELOC funds. That's awesome. Now I'm out of funds. How do I find more money for new deals? Can you refinance any of those? Have any of them gone up way in value? Maybe you can get a HELOC on one of those. That's what I would do. Or find friends and family money. Hard money is your last alternative. Thoughts on using an LLC to invest in properties, says Cryptic. Yes, I would use it. Oh, and that's what Dude Real Estate says too. Yes. EL says, when firstly, would you look at schools first because parents will do anything for their kids? What if it's great industry but poor districts? Yeah, I think great school districts is probably more important i really would look at that first or one of the first things crowdfunding sounds better and better yeah i agree letty i mean passive real estate investing is i to me the best thing that almost everybody should be doing so i don't mean to rain on your parade uh nomsicle says not about real estate but what do you know do you know about span expanding my knowledge about economics yeah have you checked out the Khan academy Check out Khan, I think it's K-A-H-N, Academy on Economics and other topics to learn almost anything. Mark, oh, have you checked the master class? Check out the master classes. There might be one course on economics, I can't promise. Markin says, opinion on using the BRRR method in the Midwest. Yes, I think you should. Cryptic says, how come you don't like mobile home investing? I love mobile home park investing. I wrote a recent uh, special report on mobile home park investing, and you can get it by going to wellingscapital.com forward slash resources, or you can actually go to my Bigger Pockets profile um, 
Mobile home investing on an individual basis is very, very, very risky. Most people trash the homes if they're just renting it. I've had three out of four trash mine, and I would never, ever, ever do it again. I'll just leave it at that, my friends. Most real estate investors who have done mobile homes agree. Joseph says, what do you think about investing in Detroit? I used to live there. Uh, I think it's a little risky, honestly, still. I just still think there's, you know, the... The population decline out of Detroit is unbelievable over the last 60 years. Isabel says, I sold a property earlier this year. Do I need to purchase another asset this year in terms of taxes? Isabel, if you didn't do a 1031 exchange, um, I don't really know how to answer that, Isabel. I think I need to know more. Um, but thank you, Nomsicles, as well. Hey, it's 5.01 p.m. Eastern, 2.01 p.m. on the left, the West Coast. Uh, and so I'm going to bring this to a close after I answer one more question. And that's going to be two more questions. Bringing clarity to confusion says, I own a three-unit building free and clear that needs major rehab. Should I get a hard money loan to rehab it or slowly fix it up? You know, the faster you can go, the better. What? $750,000? What did you spend on that? That's amazing. Okay, so that's a lot of money. I would fix it up as fast as you can because you're going to be maximizing your income stream faster if you do that. Wise Kid says, I'm only 19 and I have 100000 to invest. How can I start investing in real estate? Uh, jump on my call next Wednesday if you want to chat about it or check out crowdfunding options. EL, any way you would invest in a Section 8 multifamily? Uh, no, I wouldn't want the problems myself. Josh says, okay, so Josh Cab needs to get an answer from Nate Shields because I can see that you guys were answering some stuff before I could follow. Dan Chevreau says, recommendations on investing in New York. I wouldn't do it unless you're a really, really, really big player with lots of money to burn. Okay, Vape King did you read about that vitamin E oil? What's that about? Is a duplex the best way to begin? Um, it's a great way to begin, and I highly recommend Josh uh, Brandon Turner's method of stacking. Start with a duplex and work your way up. Check out Stacking from Brandon Turner or Steve Burgess, that's B-E-R-G-E-S, his book called The Complete Guide to Buying and Selling Apartment Buildings. That's it, folks. I am so glad. Oh, Wise Kid says, I have 10000 to invest. That's why I need to... Sorry, I probably didn't notice that there was no comma there. Uh, EL, that's too kind. Thank you so much. It's very kind of you to say that. Thank you, everybody. Hey, give me a thumbs up, a like, or a share if you like this. I'm trying to avoid getting fired by bigger pockets. That's a joke. But I really do appreciate all of you guys. I can't believe I get to do this. Robert Johnson, um, I don't think there's much difference between an LLC and an individual. It's all passed through income. So thank you very much. You guys are awesome. I'm amazed I get to do this. Thankful to Bigger Pockets. Thanks to Zach Gwynn. Thanks to everybody over there at Bigger Pockets. And thank you, my wonderful audience. I hope to see you back here next Friday. Same time, same place. Have a great weekend. And next time, uh, we're here together. It's going to be really, really cold almost all over the U.S. All right, take care. Thanks. See you next time.